The original Resident Evil 4 is one of my favorite games ever. Played it well over a hundred times. I've made an entire review explaining why I adore it, so I won't go into extensive detail here, but I absolutely cherish that game. And when Capcom announced they were remaking it, I was apprehensive. RE4 never needed a remake. It still holds up beautifully. And in my opinion, the recent RE reimaginings somewhat dropped the ball. RE2 Remake was a great game in its own right, but some of the identity of the original was lost in translation, and RE3 was a shallow rush job that ripped out even more of what made its PS1 counterpart special, and I was worried that trend would continue. Yes, I saw the flood of 10 out of 10 reviews from both mainstream critics and fellow YouTubers before this remake came out, but even so, I still went in with a healthy degree of skepticism. So after all that, I'm sure you're all curious what my contrarian ass thinks of the final product. Does it live up to the masterpiece that inspired it? Do I think it's worth all those perfect review scores it's gotten? I finished eight playthroughs of the RE4 remake, totaling just over 60 hours of playtime. I've done the vast majority of challenges and unlocked all but one piece of meaningful bonus content. I've completed this game enough times to be completely burnt out on it. By my fourth run, I was doing it more out of completionist habit than genuine enjoyment. I'm sure some of you can relate. And with all that time behind me, here's where I stand. Resident Evil 4 2023 is a fun game. It stands on its own as a quality, satisfying action title that is undoubtedly worth buying. It's also a good remake, clearly made by a team with love for the 2005 classic. It's a new interpretation that largely honors what came before, and strikes a nice balance of adding features and remixing familiar elements. It's easily the best of the recent remakes. And the original RE4 is better. Now, I'll admit here and now that there's 18 years of nostalgia bias backing that statement. I'm not blind to that, and some of the differences between new and old absolutely come down to subjective taste. But I wholeheartedly believe that while this reimagining is undeniably well-crafted, there are flaws that end up making the overall experience a bit inconsistent. Flaws that I feel become increasingly evident the more you play. I want to drive home the point that I think this game is really good. I'm not trying to be an antagonist, but I'm going to be honest about my thoughts, even if it will inevitably cause some people to reach for their torches and pitchforks. This is all just one man's opinion. You are free to disagree. Oh, and also general spoiler warning for anyone that needs it. Now that everyone hates my guts, allow me to explain why I think Resident Evil 4 Remake is great, but not quite a masterpiece. To get the obvious stuff out of the way early, this do be a good looking video game. The presentation is aiming for a darker, more creepy atmosphere, and I think it nails what it's going for. Environments have tons of detail, animations look weighty and impactful, and there's plenty of little things to pick up on and appreciate, like Ashley covering her ears when Leon fires his gun. Though looking at the regenerator, I do wonder if jiggle physics have perhaps gone too far. Music is solid, with a good mix of high-energy cinematic scores and homages to the original's memorable tunes. The track that kicks in during the shooting range's bonus stage was a big standout for me. You've been waiting for it! A flood of targets! While I'm fine with this new gloomy interpretation of the Ganado stomping grounds, the sheer levels of darkness can straight up make it difficult to see. I think there's a balance to hit between lighting being moody and being a player detriment, and RE4 doesn't quite straddle it. This wouldn't have been an issue if the game allowed you to turn on the flashlight whenever you wanted, but unfortunately its use is scripted. I don't want to be known as that guy who complains about flashlights in video games, but seriously, the only one who should be determining whether or not I can see is me. What also doesn't help is eye adaption, that effect where the camera tries to simulate the human eye adjusting to varying light conditions. It's fine in games when subtly applied, but here I think it's overdone and unnecessary. Playing on PS5 while in performance mode, I experienced the occasional frame drop, though nothing that messed with my gameplay, and some pop-in was definitely noticeable, more so at some points than others. 
There was also this bizarre lighting bug specific to PlayStation that caused several flickering dots to appear at the bottom of the screen, which only got worse the longer you played. The only way to fix this issue was to either turn on motion blur, which is fine if you're okay looking at dog shit, or turning off depth of field. I believe this bug has since been patched, but in case any PS5 users thought their console might be dying, rest assured, it was just RE4 being weird. Structure-wise, this remake follows the same general beats as the original, and there are plenty of familiar areas fans will recognize, but it does a ton to differentiate itself. If there's one compliment I can give without hesitation, it's that the environments have a more natural flow to them. The village, castle, and island come off as more believable locations, with rooms that logically segue between one another, featuring a nice combination of recreated, remixed, and all-new surroundings, all of which are integrated together smoothly. Now, there are areas and sequences from the original that didn't make the transition to the remake at all, likely because they would have felt out of place given the game's more serious tone. These cuts include the lava-filled dragon room, the two spiked ceiling traps, the bulldozer ride with Ashley, the entirety of the U3 boss fight, and the laser hallway featuring the single greatest backflip ever performed by man. Now, I've heavily criticized previous remakes for ripping out content that was integral to their classic counterparts. But I won't be doing that here. That's not because I'm happy all that stuff is gone, but I do understand how some of it would have been difficult to justify within the style of this remake, and more importantly, you never feel like anything is missing while you're playing. In RE2, and especially RE3, you could see the holes where the content should be. But here, since areas are extended, or entirely new ones are added to make up for any absences, you'd never know something was gone. It's the difference between doing surgery with a scalpel versus a crowbar. Some people criticized the original's pacing, specifically citing the castle and island chapters as overstaying their welcome a bit. I've never had an issue personally, but I understand where they're coming from, and agree that the village section definitely had the best pacing. But because of how things have been moved around here, I don't think that's the case anymore. I'd now argue that the village actually drags a bit. It's more open and explorable than before, mainly because the lake was expanded with a bunch of optional collectibles to find, but even if you mainline it, it doesn't feel as tight. The castle has gotten the biggest redesign, its floor plan is wildly different, with more claustrophobic interiors, but it has a similar momentum to the original. The island, however, got some streamlining done, and goes by a bit quicker. I mean, if you look at what was cut, the biggest chunks were from the third act. So while I think the pacing of both RE4s is good and overall similar, I'd argue the old game started stronger, while the remake wraps up stronger. Aside from U3, all the other bosses make an appearance, and for the most part, I think the updated fights here are as good, if not improved. El Gigante plays out in a similar way, and the goodest boy gets an even bigger chance to shine. Village Chief gives you more room to run around, though some of his throwables can be tricky to avoid. Verdugo is pretty much the same as before. The first encounter with Krauser has evolved from a badass knife fight cutscene to a badass knife fight you participate in, and his obstacle course slash mutation battle lives up to the original. And Sadler has you once again shooting a bunch of eyeballs, though the arena is more open, and he summons Novistadors to back him up, who thankfully are much easier to deal with now, going down in only one or two shots. The only boss fights I think are outright weaker than before are Delago and Salazar. Dealing with the lake monster is more of a slog. The harpoon hits lack some of the impact they used to have, and on repeated plays, you realize the encounter is scripted to follow the same pattern every time, making it boring. Also, the jump scare death you see by shooting the water is weak. The obvious break to a cutscene kinda ruins it. As for Salazar, I know he was just a stationary wall monster in the original, but I think they overcorrected. He leaps around the room, his body never seems to be exposed for long enough to do good damage, and his attacks can be hard to avoid, especially since he litters the floor with goo mines you have to watch out for. I wasn't looking forward to facing him again. But thankfully, you can obliterate him with an egg, trivializing the entire encounter. I'm not kidding, I now do this every time. 
As someone who's played the original religiously for almost two decades, the differences in combat between that and this remake were the biggest thing I had to get used to. Not because it's poorly done here, there's plenty to praise about the expanded combat system. I'm just so used to the flow of RE4 as I know it that it took a while for me to overcome that muscle memory. But after a couple hours, once I got used to the new rules, everything started to click, and I found my groove. In classic Resi 4, Leon was maneuvered via tank controls, and you were stuck in place whenever you decided to engage. It worked really well since that game was balanced around it, but nowadays that style of gameplay is frowned upon. Leon's movement now strikes a good balance of being more flexible and weighty in line with modern third-person shooters, and you're able to move and shoot at the same time. To compensate for this, your opponents are faster, more aggressive, and more numerous, requiring increased on-the-fly decision-making in order to keep your head. Fights are generally more frantic as you weave around attacks and take advantage of openings, with the new parry mechanic taking center stage. The knife was always a reliable, ammo-saving tool, but its utility in the remake has also been expanded. It can still be used offensively for stabbing or slashing, and can insta-kill anyone facing away from you, but now it also functions as a defensive item. With some exceptions, enemy attacks can be parried, and if timed correctly, this can fully stun an aggressor leaving them open for a kick. While a powerful ability, its usefulness is kept in check by limited durability. You can't do anything with a broken blade. Your primary knife can be repaired at the merchant for a fee, and you'll find weaker, expendable ones scattered around that can be leaned on in a pinch. This alone gives the combat sandbox more versatility, allowing for dynamic chains of events that make the player look and feel pretty cool. If you're ever overwhelmed or backed into a corner, one good parry can turn the tide completely. These elements give the combat great potential to be more fluid, stylish, and rewarding, and it lives up to that expectation more often than not. But I also think it has the same potential to feel kind of sloppy, especially at higher difficulties. Starting with minor things, a general abundance of cramped environments can cause the zoomed-in aiming view to get intrusively close as you move around, obstructing your view of threats. The dodge prompts that appear for certain unblockable attacks are pretty infrequent. During your first playthrough, they'll catch you off guard more often than not. Stealth is technically an option, but it's that same simple crouch and backstab that every modern game seems to arbitrarily include. It's fine that it's here, but at most you'll pick off one or two obvious stragglers before having to cap fools anyway. Splinter Cell, this is not. But really, all of that can be looked past easily enough. My biggest problem with this remake's gunplay can be summed up in one word that I'm sure some of you are expecting. Stagger. When you hit a Ganado in the head or leg, they become stunned for a few seconds, giving you the chance for a contextual follow-up. It's a damaging combo that creates breathing room, also pushing back any nearby enemies. However, in the remake, getting a chance to use this all-important move isn't guaranteed. Originally, the stagger effect would happen every time you wanted it to. It was an endlessly reliable cause and effect. But now, there's a chance the knife-wielding maniac bearing down on you won't react at all to your carefully placed shot. I can't tell you how many times I hit someone in the head, moved in for a kick only to realize that nothing had happened. I acknowledge that at least part of this is deeply ingrained muscle memory getting in the way. I wonder if new Resident Evil 4 players would even see this as a problem. I've heard the argument that this randomness adds a fun unpredictability to encounters, and I might agree with that if the rule was consistent, but this issue only magnifies at higher difficulties. On Assisted, enemies react every time, the way it used to be. On Standard, they react most of the time. But on Hardcore, and especially Professional, you can literally shoot a villager in the face enough times to outright kill them before they stumble once. That's ridiculous. I guess this is meant to incentivize parrying more, but defense is already plenty of incentive. Ganados are faster, more aggressive, deflecting attacks is going to happen naturally, and not having them stagger reliably adds an inconsistency to the combat loop that didn't exist before. Increase the challenge by having baddies take and dish out more damage, not by severely nerfing the player's options. It's frustrating to dump round after round into a guy waiting for a stagger you desperately need, only for it to never come. But you know who staggers more than they used to? Leon. 
Controlling our boy with the perfect hair is usually nice and responsive, but when he takes a hit, he'll react to it for a couple seconds. Depending on how he staggers, movement will be slowed a little bit, or you might fully lose the ability to fight back. You could say these reactions are realistic, and show that Leon isn't an invincible super soldier, a valid interpretation. But again, on higher difficulties, it becomes an issue. Since Ganados turn hyper-aggressive, it's possible to get stunlocked into a fatal attack string, which has never been fun in any video game ever, and is something that never happened in classic RE4. These factors make hardcore and professional playthroughs big pains in the ass that feel more unbalanced than challenging, especially S-plus runs that force you to rush through this nonsense on a fresh new game save. I'm sure there will be someone who rebuts this claim with, Sounds like a skill issue. I beat the whole game on professional knives only using my feet. Round of applause. But the viewers in my stream chat, and every friend I've talked to who's played this thing, has expressed thoughts similar to mine, so I know it's not just me. Hell, most of the S-plus guides I've looked up on YouTube straight up recommend using exploits to skip over a bunch of annoying sections. I'm not knocking the skips, they're super cool. I love how quickly they were discovered, and I really hope Capcom doesn't do something tone-deaf like try to patch them out. Update, Capcom patch some of them out. But when the optimal strategy for getting through the hardest this game has to offer is to not play the actual content, I think that says something about how bullshit and unfun it can be. Since I'm talking about inconsistency, it's a good time to bring up Ashley. To this day, there are still people that swear up and down that escorting the president's daughter was somehow terrible or annoying in the old game. I know we're all programmed to hate escort quests, but protecting Ashley has always been the shining example of how to do it right. And no, Elizabeth or Ellie don't count. They're literally invincible. I'm talking about companions that require actual effort to keep alive. Ashley was glued to your back, always did exactly what you told her to, stayed out of the way, and if she was ever in danger, it was a direct result of the player's actions. Not so anymore. Instead of having follow and wait commands, Ashley now permanently follows Leon, and the only thing you can tell her is tight or loose. Tight has her stick relatively close to your pathing, though she'll always be playing catch-up even if you're walking slowly in a straight line, while Loose has her running around like a headless chicken, and I can't tell you which is preferable or in what situation you'd want one over the other. Because you have so much less control over her, and there always tends to be a gap of some kind between you, she naturally gets into more trouble, requiring you to go out of your way to save her. Is there anyone that thinks this is an improvement over what we had before? Are those of you that complained about Ashley actually happier with this new system? Because to me, this is a clear downgrade. I used to only put the unlockable knight's armor on her for New Game Plus runs, but in the remake, I don't think I'll ever take it off now that I have it, because I don't want to deal with the annoyance. To wrap up the last few things tied to the core gameplay, the attaché case is more or less the same. It's a little bigger now to account for crafting resources which have been added, and they can be used to make a variety of ammo types and grenades. You can now swap weapons on the fly during gameplay, a nice update so you don't have to constantly pause the action. But you'll still be opening the case all the time to craft stuff, so you end up spending about as much time in there as before. It's not a big deal, it's just a funny unintended consequence. I also didn't like the auto-sort feature at first. It never organized stuff in a way I was happy with, so I ignored it my first playthrough, but in subsequent runs when I was just trying to blaze through the game, I learned to appreciate that it was there. When it comes to treasure hunting, you'll find many more gems in the remake, and most valuables have slots to put them in. Depending on what gems you slot into any given treasure, as indicated by this handy-dandy chart, a multiplier will be applied to the base price, greatly increasing their sell value. It's a simple system, but there's a definite satisfaction in maximizing your profits by combining the right gems in the right items. And while we're talking about profits, the Merchant. His function as gun dealer and upgrader is the same as always. You'll check in with him every chance you get to improve your arsenal. New to the remake is a trading system, where spinels, spinels, whatever, have been repurposed as their own special currency that can be spent on weapon attachments, treasure maps, and various other useful items. 
While spinels can be found sparsely as drops, you'll earn the majority of them doing the new merchant requests. These are all pretty menial tasks, shoot medallions, catch a fish, kill some snakes, stuff like that, but they're easy to do and rarely ask you to go out of your way, so they're worth doing for the rewards they unlock. As for the man himself, I do think the merchant's new voice is good, and he has a likable personality that's in line with his debut. But he also doesn't know when to shut the fuck up. The merchant used to only talk when you did something. His lines were an audio confirmation of player input. Now he just babbles on as you browse. He won't let 10 seconds pass without chiming in, and you'll have heard all his lines by your second or third interaction. I don't know why some newer games seem to be scared of letting the player sit in silence for a minute, but it's just kind of obnoxious. The shooting range also returns with a mix of challenges, some of which can really test your skill or patience, depending who you ask. Doing well at the range earns tokens for a vending machine that reward charms, three of which can be attached to your case at any given time. These charms give you passive buffs like increased movement speed, crafting bonuses, and store discounts to name a few. I don't mind their addition, even if I mostly ignored them after my first playthrough, and I do like that their models ripped straight from the original RE4. But I don't like that which charm you get is random, and you can get duplicates. It's needless RNG that draws out the process of collecting them for no good reason. On to story and characters. Scenes, dialogue, and tone are different than before in various ways, but the basic A to B outline of the plot remains the same. Leon is still trying to save Ashley, allies are still allies, and evil people are still evil. It's just a darker, more somber reimagining of familiar events. Many RE4 fans, myself included, adored the cheesy campiness that permeated the original. Whether intentional or not, it complemented Leon's increasingly ridiculous journey so damn well. But these days, Resident Evil in general has been attempting to take its storytelling and atmosphere more seriously. There's still some cheese, it hasn't been ripped out entirely, but if the OG was a big block of cheddar, the remake is a few slices of provolone. The cast themselves have all transformed in one way or another, though many of the changes will come down to personal preference. Here's where I stand on everyone. Leon is more restrained. He's confident in his skills, but doesn't come off quite as action hero cocky. He still drops plenty of one-liners, some of them arguably more groan-worthy than his OG counterpart, though none of them ever reach the same level of dumb charm as, No thanks, bro. As an evolution of the character as presented in RE2 make, this interpretation feels natural, and while I still prefer classic B-movie Leon, this new version works well too. And since she's so minor, I'll also throw in here that Hunnigan is fine. She was never a major part of either game, so I could take or leave either version. Ashley is the one character I would argue is a blanket improvement over her previous incarnation. I never had a problem with Miss Graham before, I think what people say about her annoyance levels are way overblown, but looking back, she does just kinda roll with everything that's going on. But her characterization here is much more believable. She's rightfully terrified when you first meet her, and apprehensive of this stranger escorting her to safety, but over time she warms up to Leon and becomes more used to the violence that's happening around her. Because the pair chat during gameplay, their relationship has time to naturally develop, and whenever they get separated, it happens for logical reasons. She also gets a few good moments to shine, like when she resists the Plaga's influence to avoid hurting Leon. I definitely prefer this version of Ashley. If only escorting her didn't suck. Luis is a weird one, because I'm kind of torn. On one hand, his presentation here is fine, and he's given more to do. He's a bigger part of the plot, his backstory gets additional fleshing out, he even pals around with you for an entire chapter, all of which I appreciate. On the other hand, his previous self did the whole suave charmer thing way better, I simply found him more likable. He didn't have that much screen time, but you definitely remembered him. In a perfect world, I'd combine the personality of old with the backstory of new. But what we have now works alright. Krauser is another weird one to me, though admittedly for a much more arbitrary reason. His and Leon's backstory is given additional detail, the knife fights with him are great, 
And his change in motivation from undercover Wesker lackey to disillusioned soldier seeking ultimate power totally works. It's just his voice I'm not sold on. That's not because it's bad by any means. The acting is solid, but the graveliness of it sounds like a put-on, like someone doing an impression. The original Krauser sounded more natural in my opinion. Maybe it's just me, and again, I think the actor did a good job, I just can't unhear that. What about our main villains, Sadler and Salazar? Well, they're downgrades across the board. The excited scenery-chewing the duo previously had is completely missing from the former, and mostly missing from the latter. Salazar still has his pompous ego, but his fun, scheming presence is replaced with a simpler creep factor, and it's not that interesting. He and Mr. Kennedy don't interact nearly as much, so that Bond villain thing he had going is neutered, and he's kinda boring as a result. Sadler has even less of a presence. The radio conversations that Leon once had with both villains are entirely gone, as is Sadler's introduction in the church. Leon and Sadler do not officially meet until chapter 14 of 16, when there's maybe an hour of game left, and at that point, there's no time for our antagonist to antagonize. His personality has also been hit with the boring stick. OG Sadler would ham it up, to a degree that made you question if he even bought into all the religious dogma he spouted. But now he's just generic cult leader, there's nothing more to him, and it's pretty lame. I've saved the worst for last, and unfortunately, that honor goes to Ada Wong. The flirtatious femme fatale that went on missions in a dress for kicks is dead and gone, but it's not the alternate take on the character that's the issue. Ada in Ari 2 make also lost most of her seductress edge, but at least she was still acted well. In Ari 4, the voice performance is simply bad. She sounds bored, as if this spy shit is your everyday 9 to 5. You walk away now, and who knows? Maybe you'll live to meet me again. She comes off as so disinterested that it removes any sense that Ada genuinely cares about Leon, so whenever she helps him, it seems like it's nothing more than a means to an end. I don't think that was the intent, it's just the consequence of the poor delivery. I'm aware that the actress has gotten some degree of backlash for this, and of course, anyone going out of their way to harass her is a piece of garbage but sympathy doesn't make the performance any better. I don't know if she didn't have adequate time to prepare, or if the voice director was asleep at the wheel, but this is absolutely the weakest portrayal of Ada the series has ever seen. Data miners quickly discovered references to separate ways within the remake's files, basically confirming that her side campaign will be added as DLC at some point down the road. But personally, I am not at all interested in spending any more time with this version of Ada. As far as the special unlockables go, the remake is a bit of a mixed bag for me. The challenge system is back, it's become a standard inclusion in Resident Evil the last few years, and while it still works for what it is, I am personally a bit sick of seeing it. It ends up dragging out the completionist process, with some challenges having specific requirements that pretty much necessitate their own entire playthroughs. But what's really important is whether or not all that effort is ultimately worth it, so let's go over what you get. Starting with weapons, there's the Primal Knife, which can be upgraded to be unbreakable. Let's you slash and parry all day long without worry, it's a nice tool to have. The hand cannon still kicks like a mule and blows chunks off anything it hits. It's as effective as it always was, no complaints. The infinite rocket launcher has been significantly improved from the original. It used to be slow and forced you to scope in when you aimed it, but now you can just spam it with reckless abandon. The Chicago typewriter, now renamed the Chicago sweeper, is a shell of what it once was. They ruined my baby. Before, it was uber-powerful in every way, now it's just an SMG with infinite ammo. It's also wildly inaccurate, so it's common to hit everything but your target if they're more than 10 feet away. It's not a bad weapon, it has its place, but it's lost most of its oomph. And lastly, the PRL is missing entirely, and that sucks. One of the few complaints I ever had about classic RE4 was that it was lacking in special outfits, 
When it was first released on GameCube, there was only one extra set, RPD and Popstar. Then, from the PS2 port on, the Mobster and Night set was added, but still, that was only two, and I hoped that a remake would go all out, giving us a few more options. I was both surprised and disappointed to learn that in the remake, Leon and Ashley each only have one unlockable outfit. Leon gets his mob suit, and Ashley gets her armor, which thankfully still makes her indestructible. But that's it. I'm sure some of you are looking at your screen and thinking, no, Craig, they clearly each have three options to choose from, but that's an illusion. Having the choice to let our leads keep their jackets is nice and all, but let's not pretend these are new outfits. They're just the default looks. Where the hell is the RPD uniform, at least? I mean, you already remade RE2 on the same engine as this game. Take that asset and throw it in. To be fair, they did add something. Unique to this version are accessories. Silly, extra clothing items you can throw on whenever you want. A handful even apply useful buffs. But the total inability to apply more than one at a time diminishes their inclusion. There are hats, glasses, and masks. You'd think you'd be able to wear one of each, but nope, for some reason you're restricted. Why undermine the player's creative freedom like that? Oh, and Ashley gets totally shafted. She gets one pair of sunglasses. That's it. Don't worry, though. There are actually a bunch of other costumes you can get for our heroes. They just aren't in the base game. Capcom continues its trend of day one DLC by selling the aforementioned outfits, a couple of weapons, screen filters that no one will use, the original game's soundtrack, and a map that uncovers special treasures that are otherwise unobtainable. So cool. I've gone on record before as hating this practice, and I still do. I've seen some argue that all of this is extra content, so of course they're gonna charge for it, but what they don't understand is that it's not extra content. It was all ready to go, could have easily been included in the game as unlockables, but instead Capcom chose to rip these pieces out to make a quick buck. Looking silly on replays is part of the charm of costumes like this, but put them behind a paywall, and no thank you. All this Day 1 DLC came bundled with the Deluxe Edition of RE4, which cost $10 more than the standard copy. That means that this additional content was valued at $10. Now, let's say you're like me, and chose to buy the regular game as to not support this crappy business practice. But then later, you're having such a good time with the game that you decide, you know what, I think I want that DLC now. I'll, I'll gladly give Capcom that extra $10 to show my support. Well, fuck you, now it's 20. Gotta punish those ingrates that didn't pay up front, am I right? A couple weeks ago, that's where I would have ended the review, but the upside to chronic procrastination is that I get to talk about all the post-launch additions. Two new things were added to the game. First is Mercenaries, the staple arcade mode that's been in plenty of Resident Evil titles. As a timer ticks down, you take out as many enemies as you can, trying your best to maintain combos for time bonuses and high scores. This iteration introduces a meter that builds as you get kills, and whenever you see fit, you can use this meter to activate Mayhem mode, granting powerful abilities unique to each character. It's all good fun, and thanks to the expanded combat system, is one of the easiest mercenaries to pick up, as far as I can remember. I had no trouble doing well my first go with each of the available leads. Special shout out to Hunk, whose kit is absurdly broken, as it should be. That said, this is another case of the remake providing less. While mercenaries in the original RE4 had five characters and four maps to choose from, here you only get four characters and three maps. Plus, there are no additional challenges or unlockables added to complement the minigame, so aside from personal high score chasing, there's little incentive to play it. Unless you haven't unlocked the hand cannon yet, in which case you can have it for the low price of one S rank per map. Not one S rank with each character, just one per map, period. Completely unaware of this, I had the hand cannon in less than 30 minutes, which is really cool for me, but it's also kind of a slap in the face to anyone who unlocked it the hard way by overcoming the most brutal of the campaign. The second thing that was quietly added to the remake two weeks after launch were microtransactions. You just couldn't help yourself, could you, Capcom? For $3 a piece, you can buy as many exclusive upgrade tickets as you desire. 
These are normally an item you get by trading with the merchant. They let you instantly unlock the exclusive power for whatever gun you want, which depending on the weapon are things like massive critical hit chance, raw damage multipliers, or infinite ammo. As a rare in-game item, that's fine, but the conversation changes when they start selling them. It's a microtransaction that gives the player power. By definition, that makes them pay to win. Ultimately, you can easily ignore these things, and the only experience you'd be affecting is your own. But the fact that Capcom is selling you the option is scummy, especially when you factor in that they waited two full weeks to add these purchases, knowing full well they'd be a blemish that could take away even a smidge of the praise the game was destined to receive. I personally find that to be gross and underhanded. But surprisingly, there are plenty of people who don't, as I discovered firsthand when I criticized these paid tickets on Twitter. I got a shocking amount of backlash. People called me a gatekeeper, which, no, Capcom is the gatekeeper. Here's the gate. Others wrote off the purchases because they're not that bad compared to more heinous examples, and while they're right, not being as bad as something still means they're bad. Some even proudly declared they were gonna buy five tickets just to spite me. Okay, make the industry worse to stick it to a stranger on the internet. You win? But outside of all that nonsense, the actual main counter I saw endlessly repeated was that these tickets were a great option for players without the ability or time to unlock stuff normally. Capcom were being magnanimous for giving those with busy lives the option to speed up progress and make the game easier, and why should I have a problem with that? Because they're charging for it. I understand that not everyone has the time or patience to play through a game ten times, and I'd be totally open to a simple toggle in the options that gave players unlimited tickets, or even one that unlocked all the bonus weapons up front, provided enabling this toggle also disabled challenges, achievements, and trophies. That way, the people who can't dedicate their life to the game still get to have a fun time blasting through it, while those who put in the effort to earn the content naturally are acknowledged for doing so and given the sense of accomplishment that they deserve. Games used to have options like this. They were called cheat codes, and the only reason that companies are selling these shortcuts now is because they can, and because there are fools who will aggressively defend them. It's not like Capcom is slaving away making these tickets, you're not actually buying meaningful content, it's simply a way for them to take advantage of those who lack patience or time. Please, stop white knighting for bad business practices, no matter how insignificant you think they are. It's not a hill worth dying on, and believe me when I say, you should expect better. We deserve better. Looking back at my script, I'm sure I come off as more negative than I intend. That's just kind of how my brain works. But let me state one more time here at the finish line. Resident Evil 4 Remake is a great game. It's worth playing, worth buying. I'm glad that it's selling well, and I can almost guarantee that anyone who plays it will enjoy it. I simply prefer the 2005 original for the reasons I've outlined. You could argue that I feel that way because of a nostalgic bias, the same way I could argue that the glowing reviews of the remake are fueled by hype bias, but at that point we'd all just be arguing in circles and that is not productive at all. Whenever a remake for any kind of media comes out, the inevitable debates start. Does the new thing replace the old thing? In what ways does it make what came before obsolete? And for the most part, these are silly talking points. Both versions can happily coexist, especially in this case. The original RE4 was ported to every system under the sun. You can easily play it right this minute without jumping through any hoops. And regardless of which take on Leon's rescue mission you personally prefer or think is better, almost everyone can agree they're both high-quality experiences that you'll have a good time with. There's no wrong choice here. But as well-made as this version of Resi 4 is, I really hope Capcom slows down on the remakes for a good long while. I know they won't, but this remake was already unnecessary, and that only becomes more true as you continue down the mainline entries. The one game you could argue is in need of a top-to-bottom modernization is Code Veronica. 
But even then, I'd really prefer they stop going back to the well. No matter how much you freshen up the coat of paint, I don't want to keep replaying the same stories over and over again. Focus on creating exciting new stuff with fresh ideas. Actual fresh ideas, not the shallow RE theme park that Village was. But tangent aside, and as tired as I am with remakes overall, this new spin on Resident Evil 4 is still a damn fine title, and even though I don't think it's the instant masterpiece everyone else says it is, doing justice to what I consider one of the best games ever made, to even a moderate degree, is absolutely worthy of respect.